بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم دس از آمنا گل فرام دا ڈپارٹمنٹ آف جرنلزم اینڈ میس کمیونیکیشن اور بیک ود دا کورس کمیونیکیشن تھیریز ٹو بیئرنگ دا کوڈ جی ایم سی تھری ون ٹو اٹس اور فورٹینتھ لیکچر اینڈ دا ٹاپک ٹو ڈے از اسٹڈنگ کمیونیکیشن تھیری اٹس ایکچولی دا کنٹینیشن آف آر لاسٹ لیکچر So what we started in our last lecture, we were discussing images of theory and then we were supposed to go towards, so actually in this lecture, we'll first revisit the images of theory and then we'll uh, move towards the essential features of communication. <clears throat> As I told you earlier, this uh, definition of uh, Judy Bergun, that uh, theories, uh, a theory consists of a set of systematic hunters about the way things operate. So the whole uh, concept was how this works, uh, that uh, we discussed three elements in it. The first one uh, from Burgun's notion of theory was the idea that a theory consists of a set of hunches. It's not just one single hunch, but it is a set of hunches. Then the second point that we discussed was uh, the, what, is the, uh, what is the meaning of saying that those hunches are informed hunches. And lastly, we discussed that the, uh, that the hunches have to be systematic. Uh, for the case of set of hunches, we actually ha used this image where we talked about, for example, that this is a hunch that for, uh, bees or uh, dogs, they can smell fear. So we said that it's uh, like theories of, in case of theories, since these are hunches, it always means that we are not sure of the answer, fine? So when there is no puzzle or, for example, there is no um, explanation, uh, the explanation is obvious, so obviously there is no need to develop a theory. But whenever we have some element of speculation, then theories need to, uh, the theorists need to work it out and they need to go beyond accepted wisdom. So, you know, whenever you launch a theory, you come up with a theory, you actually want people because you have set it, uh, you see the logic in that theory, you see, uh, you can foresee how things work. But uh, when you launch it, you want others to embrace it as well. But this is not the case because for them, it is just in the hunch category because it has not yet developed, it is not yet proved. So it is that game. For example, in case of this thing that, for example, uh, dogs and bees, they can smell fear. So we need to find it out. We need more explanation in case of developing a theory that for how do they smell it? Like, is it because the odor of the smell, uh, sweat is different, for example, in case of fright due to anxiety, and it is different from the odor that is from owing to, for example, heat or from hard work of uh, like sweating owing to heat or sweating owing to hard work. So similarly, uh, um, Is it just bees or even butterflies can smell? Or is it just dogs or even kittens can smell it? So theory construction involves multiple hunches. We had discussed that. Then after that discussion, for example, the first point was scent of hunches. Then the second point was informed hunches. So we discussed that Burgoon's definition, it says that the hunches, they need to be informed, the hunches by a theorist. So, for example, if there is a hunch uh, that uh, mm, money thrown from the Empire State Building will become one feet embedded or deeply embedded in the uh, sidewalk or in the pavement, fine. So, mm, they need to, the young theorists need to check it out. For example, if there are any articles to read about it, if there are people, you can talk to them about it, if there are. Obviously, if it's, since it is a process, it is an action in place, so you can actually observe that action, you can even experiment on it. And then from all of these, you can develop an insight on the subject, fine? So whatever ways there are to have your, uh, have some information backing your hunch, backing your um, guess. So... 
um, from that point of view, it is very much necessary that you need to be uh, educated about the guesses. Those guesses are not just guesses. Those are not just hunches. Those are informed or educated ones. Okay, and those are not accidental things or byproducts of some some uh, um, uh, action or activity in life. Rather, the um, theories tend to result when their creators they've prepared themselves to discover something in their environment which actually triggers the process of theory construction. Then we talked about um, the hunches that are systematic, that uh, see scholars uh, reserve the term theory for an integrated system of concepts. So um, a theory that does not lay out multiple ideas, uh, it also, uh, like it, uh, theory just does not lay out multiple ideas, rather it specifies a relationship among them. Fine. So, for example, what is the relationship of those things? How do they systematically, logically fit in? How these things are related? That is very much really, um, necessary. Now, in this case, these are all the theories by young theorists, and these are just one short theories, like one picture. They do not offer much explanation. So, these are actually not systematic. These are not actually developed theories. These are just hunches. These, uh, for, uh, uh, for any theory, you, uh, f whichever you go through, you have a right to expect that this, it is based on a set of systematic and uh, informed hunches. Okay, so it's not just going to be one, rather it's going to be many, and then those have to be informed and as well as systematic. Having said that, we move towards the images of theory where I told you that actually uh, we've been through a couple of verbal definitions of theory, uh, but more, many of us tend to learn better visually and they would appreciate uh, a concrete image that helps us understand what a theory is and what it does and there are certain people, certain philosophers, certain uh, scientists who have presented certain metaphors uh, to represent theory. Mm. So let's see if these work for us. The first one that we discussed was uh, theories as nets. This was actually um, uh, <clears throat> proposed by Karl Popper that theories are nets cast to catch what we call the world. Now the mesh, uh, the mesh of the net, theorists try to make it ever finer and finer in order to catch more and more and more and more aspects of the world. Uh, so basically it's a laborious task for the um, scholars um, and uh, for serious scholars, see theories are the main thing. They are the tools of the trade, and it's very, uh, it's intelligently said that the world can be interpreted with everything like under the sun. This is the terminology. Otherwise, obviously, theories cover the sun as well, but it is just a terminology like everything under the sun. So, um, but when we talk about communication in this aspect. Uh, we find it difficult because like human communication, human behavior, it is very complicated. Mm, it's not just like fish that can be caught with a net or particular types of nets. But you, how, how do humans think? What do we, they say? Why they say what they say? What they do? Why they do what they do? So these are quite very complicated things that, f for example, doesn't seem very, very much appropriate to use the terminology of nets for that. So <clears throat> once again, we can go look further. The second imagery is that of lenses. Like it can be a camera lens, it can be a lens in the glasses, but like lens is different from mirror. I'll clarify this here again, that for uh, mirror gets, gives you a ditto same reflection of what is happening. 
and for theories theories cannot tell exactly completely so it's not like mirror is not used the imagery used is that of lens so let's consider a camera lens for example when you obviously all of you have these smartphones and you use the camera to take selfies and to mm, take different pictures so you choose for example so there are times you choose panorama there are times you choose a uh, portrait there are times you choose certain lighting, there are times you choose certain colors, there are times you tend to um, zoom in, there are times you ten tend to zoom out. So actually it was the camera lens and I uh, related it to the smartphones that you most of you use smartphones for that. So depending on how you tackle the camera lens, you get a different um, output, you get a different kind of picture, you can get a different kind of recording, all because of your choice of lens or the kind of effects that you tend to have, okay? In the current scenarios, obviously, we do have this effect setup. That is why you talked about effects. Otherwise, you can just imagine the lens. Just imagine the kind of lens that you are using, for example, or even just imagine zooming in and zooming out, okay? So that is kind of an easy imagery. So on the basis of that, if you zoom in, for example, you get different details. And if you zoom out, you get a com more complete picture, but it's not that detailed then because certain things are not focused in it. So from that perspective, we talked about, let's suppose there is uh, an argument between you and someone uh, in another semester, let's suppose. And a senior, yes, there's an argument between you and a senior. And uh, at the end of the argument, it works out that, for example, you people were planning a um, party a departmental party and uh, you people walk out that we are not in this party okay now for some people if there was one theorist or uh, he would look at it for example uh, with the perspective that there's an argument and there was a, a breakup in the plan and this um, uh, departmental unity is effective or a relationship has broken up but for some others it might be uh, your freedom of expression it might be democracy in action so once again with the metaphor lens there is this problem that for example oh we might not be able to see what is true or real because the kind of perspective that we are using the kind of lens that we are using with that things change you see there's all in all the media wars we talk about this thing that there are certain perspectives that are highlighted and there are certain perspectives that are played down upon or that are simply um, uh, avoided in the media industry so that thus uh, reality is manipulated then the third one that we discussed is theories as maps see what does a map do uh, currently we all probably all of us have maps services on uh, maps applications on our smartphones and let's suppose we go to a different uh, city for example let's suppose uh, you have not been to Islamabad or Lahore or Karachi or any other major city and you have to attend a conference at a certain venue so what is the easiest way out you just put in the location and the map navigates okay so with the map thing, actually, it actually tells us uh, how communication works, okay? With the map imagery, the map tells you a, a way of going from your starting point to the destination that you want to go. It's not the only way to go, but it gives you a direction. There can be certain other directions that the map shows or does not show. And if you change route, it re, uh, it redirects you. It gives you, once again, another route to reach that direction. Okay? So, the, this is the kind of thing that uh, maps, they, they give you a lot of richness, but obviously not the richness of the reality, but still it can show you all these things. So, this is kind of a better imagery for theories. In this case, then I started sharing with you a video that we'll complete now so that uh, we're done with it. 
so we're starting from the very beginning of the video because obviously it was left in between and then it doesn't make much of sense since i explained the earlier parts of it, this one so i'll look into i'll explain when we're into the part where i did not do the explanation then actually what is theory so it's a set of systematic informed hunches about the way things worth so theory kind of helps us connect the dots about what we're seeing in daily life what we're seeing in these situations happening you know if you have enough dots that kind of are all together people create theories to say this is what i think's going on like this is the relationship i see between those um there's always an element of speculation with it because you know unlike the hard sciences people are always changing they do you know you could put the same person in the same situation two different times and they might respond differently based on you know what they learn from that first time um, but with theory you have to have defined key terms so we all have to agree on the meaning of the words we're talking about because if you and i have a different definition of the word symbol then we're probably not going to be able to come to a consensus about that particular aspect of this theory and before you develop a theory you have to have a lot of good background information you have to know what other people are saying about this situation that you're looking at, um, what people have said in the past. And then are there any other alternative explanations that might be possible um, based on other theories that are already in use? It's really, really hard to kind of come up with a new theory um, because, well, the communication discipline's pretty old, but it's just, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it's always possible, you know, hopefully there'll be new communication theories in my lifetime, um, probably a lot with social media um with as much as it's gained popularity in the past 10 15 years but you know we don't know people are still connecting those dots together so how can we conceptualize theory you know for some people i can just say yeah it's a way of looking at the world or creating things and i'm like okay yeah that's great but for a lot of us we really need to kind of get a mental picture of what it might look like so there's three metaphors that we typically use in the communication discipline. So nets, lenses, and maps, and all kind of have their good things and their bad things about them. So you just have to pick the one that works best for you. So theories as nets. So Karl Popper said that theories are nets cast to catch what we call the world. So you can have grand theories, which might be more big nets, but that's saying something that happens in all communication instances all the time. And that's really hard to pin down because people are very complex and with that you'd still need a lot of smaller nets to catch those smaller fishes to be able to capture these distinct acts in small situations on an individual level but like i said people are complex people are not fish you cannot weave a theory so tightly as to capture everything um, it's really hard to say you know all people do this in all situations or every time someone's in this situation they will do this or they will communicate in this way or act this way it's it's nigh on impossible you can look at a theory as a lens so like a camera okay so with nets for example this is the criticism that actually uh, communication behavior human communication this cannot be actually uh, compared with fish that can be uh, cast with a net, okay, that can uh, that can be cast with uh, using nets. Now moving towards the second one, since we had done the previous part, we had already done, I had put in my discussions, my inputs are there, so for that matter, I let it be. Now in theories and as lenses, I'll be giving in my inputs as well, so that you are better able to understand these concepts. Let's go. Lens. So you have different lenses, you have a 35 millimeter, you have a 50 millimeter, you have fisheye, you have 18, 24, you know, 200 millimeter, whatever. It shapes our perception by focusing on some features of a, of a situation, of a context, while ignoring other things. So like with a fisheye lens, you can see a whole bunch of things. So you can see more, but with the 200, it's really, really zoomed in. You can only get a specific thing in there. But that's saying, you know, two people could look at the same situation and depending on which type of lens they're using, they will have very different interpretations and explanations of what is going on. The downside with this, though, if all of these situations depend on the lens that people is using, you know, some people might abandon the search for truth because, well, truth is relative. It all depends on which lens you're using. 
I would argue that there is, you know, obviously a truth and, you know, maybe both of the people in the situation are wrong based on the lens they're using, but there is an actual thing that is happening that you would have to find the right lens for. And then theories is map. So with theories and lenses, you're always in this, um, and this, uh, there's a chance that you might be choosing the wrong lens. So depending on the lens, the whole story changes. For example, we have had these discussions a couple of times with reference to specifically media. Uh, that, For example, the choice of words used for uh, people changes the whole story. Mm, remember we had these discussions about different uh, adjectives being used uh, for uh, people that uh, or for the circumstances that actually changes the whole context. So similarly, the kind of lens being used, it changes the whole context of the whole thing. What is being shown by the media, how it is being discussed, it changes the context. So there is always this chance that you are choosing the wrong lens or you are looking at uh, you're the pic looking at the picture too broadly or you are looking at it too narrowly like too f too much focused into so it is once again uh, there are downsides to it now moving to the third one which is theories as maps which is i think the one that the book um likes to use so they're designed to help us navigate some type of human relationship but as they say in there and i'm quoting it because i really like the words that they use you know the map is not the territory you know no single theory can portray the richness of interaction between people that is constantly changing always varied and inevitably more complicated than what any theory can chart so your takeaway from this should this is an excellent explanation. I would want that you should write it down, that the map is not the territory. For example, the map is just a way of showing the territory, a way or a reflection of that. It's not, the richness is not the same. For example, when you use, for example, Google Maps, so they just give you an idea of that thing, but they cannot show you the whole scenery, the details, everything. So no theory can actually portray the richness of interaction between people um, and the interaction which is constantly changing. It is always varied and inevitably it is more complicated than what any theory can chart. So then it is an excellent explanation. Humans are complicated and theories are just kind of a helpful way to shape how we look at certain situations. So if I want to look at health communication, which is something I'm interested in, I might not use expectancy violations theory because that would probably not be a very helpful lens, a very helpful net, a very helpful map to look at something in regards to health communication. Maybe I'd look at the health belief model because that is something more tailored to health communication, might be more helpful as a lens to look at it through or a net to catch what I'm looking for or a map to lead me in the right direction. So this was an explanation of how uh, these three images can work uh, work out. It is once again uh, dependent on you. Which one do you like? Which one you think is the most appropriate? But the book that, <clears throat> the reference book that uh, we are using, it actually supports the uh, imagery of maps more. Uh, the kind of uh, theories that were mentioned, uh, these are dependent on obviously the kind of work that you are doing. Dependent on what you are studying, your choice of theories changes. Now, having said that, we discussed that we'll be discussing what is communication with the reference to like we need to relate it with theories. Now, communication is the relational process of creating and interpreting messages that elicit a response. As yet, no single definition has risen to the top and become the standard within the field of communication. When it comes to defining what it is we study, there is little discipline in the discipline of communication. So um, despite the pitfalls trying to define communication in an all-inclusive way, it seems to me that students who are willing to spend a big chunk of their uh, uh, 
university education studying communication, they deserve a description of what it is they are looking at. Rather than giving the final word on what human activities can legitimately be referred to as communication, this lecture would highlight the essential features of communication that should not be missed. So for starters, this is the uh, working definition that I've just put on the slide, that communication is the relational process of creating and interpreting messages that elicit a response. So to the extent that there is redeeming value in this statement, it lies in drawing your attention to five features of communication uh, that you run across repeatedly as you read about theories in this field. Mm, in, this, in the rest of this lecture, I'll just flesh out these concepts. The first one is messages. Now, messages are the very core of communication. Study, University of Colorado communication professor Robert Craig says that communication involves talking and listening, writing and reading, performing and witnessing, or more generally, doing anything that involves messages in any medium or situation. When academic areas such as um, psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science, literature, mass communication, and philosophy deal with human symbolic activity, they interact with the study of communication. The visual image of this intersection of interests has promoted some to refer to communication as a crossroads discipline. The difference is that communication scholars are parked at the junction, focusing on messages, whereas other disciplines are just passing through on their way to other destinations. All of the theories covered in this course deal specifically with messages. Communication theorists use the word text as, synonym, as a synonym for a message uh, that can be studied regardless of the medium. A book is a text. So is a verbatim transcript of a conversation with your instructor, a recorded presidential news conference, a silent YouTube video, or a song on your iPod. All of these are text. So text is a record of a message that can be analyzed by others. For example, it can be a book, a film, photograph, any transcript or recording of any speech or broadcast. So um, text is a very uh, diverse concept. Okay, There can be a lot of diversity to it. Now, the second essential feature is creation of messages. The phrase in the working definition indicates that the content and form of text are usually constructed, invented, planned, crafted, constituted, selected, or adopted by the communicator. Each of these terms is used in one or more of the theories that we'll be describing later on, and they all employ, imply that the communicator is usually making a conscious choice of message, mess, uh, message its form, and its substance, for whatever reason. Your friend, for example, sent you a text message that, rather than meeting you face to face or calling you on the phone or sending an email or writing a note. So you see, your friend also chose that, uh, that kind of uh, words that are to be transmitted to your cell phone. For example, when it, whenever your friend is sending you a message, let's suppose there is a situation. So there is a long history of textual analysis in the field of communication, wherein the rhetoric critic looks for clues in the message to discern the motivation and strategy of the person who created the message, why he chose certain things over other things. There are, of course, many times when we speak, write, or gesture in seemingly mindless ways, activities that are like driving on cruise control. Now, these are pre-programmed responses that were selected earlier and stored for later use. In like manner, a, a repertoire of stock phrases such as, thank you, no problem, whatever, uh, or other words that uh, express our feelings 
over time have become habitual responses. Uh, only when we become more mindful of the nature and impact of our messages will we have the ability to alter them. The third, messages do not interpret themselves. The meaning that a message holds for both the creators and receivers doesn't reside in the words that are spoken, written, or acted out. A truism among communication scholars is that words don't mean things, people mean things. Symbolic interactionist Herbert Blumer say, states that, um, states its implication, humans act towards people or things on the basis of the meanings they assign to those people or things. Now, this is quite a very detailed thing, but actually no words. For example, um, different words, for example, thank you. Now, there is no meaning in this word, but actually we attach meanings to this term. We, there are terms that we... Uh, we are pleased with, there are terms that we are offended by and actually it is all dependent on the kind of meanings we attach to those terms, otherwise the terms are have got nothing to do with that. Now, this is something very much detailed and we have a lot of theories working on these. The fourth, the Greek philosopher highlights observed that no one um, one cannot step into the same river twice. Now, these words illustrate the widespread acceptance among communication scholars that communication is a process. Like Much like a, a river, the flow of communication is always an influx, never completely the same and can only be described with reference to what went before and what is yet to come. That's because communication is a process, not a freeze frame snapshot. Um, fifth, messages that elicit a response. The final component of communication deals with the effect of the message upon people who receive it. For whatever reason, if the message fails to stimulate any cognitive, emotional, or behavioral reaction, it seems pointless to refer to it as communication. We often refer to such situation as a message falling on deaf ears, or what we use the term, kaan <laughs> pijunayrengi, or the other person turning a blind eye. So surely you would respond to your friend's message in one way or another, but we use the terminology there. So that's all for today. Thank you.